This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 869, recorded on Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. Science appreciates manatees. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Blair Bazdurich, and today we will fill your head with snakes, spritz, and spiders. But first... Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twiss. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program deals with subjects of a scientific nature. Occasionally, some people think that science is biased against their politics, their religion, or their financial interests. So, before we dig into stories, a few words about science. Science is a way of observing the world objectively, without politics, without religion, without commercial concerns, and without human bias of any kind. Science is a method, a process of asking and interrogating questions that can be broken down into steps. First, you ask a question based on existing knowledge or on a new observation. Next, you hone that question into a hypothesis considering what the answer might be and narrowing it down to a testable core. Then you make a prediction about the hypothesis and design an experiment based on that prediction, putting constraints on the experiment to remove any bias the researcher may have for a result, which is why there are randomized double blinds, control groups, and sufficient sample sizes required to protect this all from bias. Most importantly, it must be able to disprove the prediction. If an experiment cannot disprove the prediction that is based on your hypothesis, there is no point in running the experiment. Then you run the experiment. Whatever the result, it alone cannot prove a hypothesis. Only disprove or allow for it to be interrogated further. And the final step is to ask a better question form a new hypothesis, and build another experiment based on the new knowledge. With this relatively simple set of instructions, with this ethic of integrity, of logic, we make science possible. Without it, there is no such thing as science. And without science, there could be no such thing as This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good to you good Blair yes good science to you Justin Kiki is not with us this evening she is busy doing Dr. Kiki things but in the meantime Justin and I are here to give you all of the science thank you for joining us tonight we have an amazing show ahead on tonight's show what do I have I have those snakes I mentioned I have sprays or spritzes I have see-through tissues i have sperm i have all sorts of stories to make up for the lack of dr kiki what do you have justin i've got how ai will kill everyone caring for caribou uh, which covid vaccine is the best a two-legged fossil find and how to keep ai from being rude rude you don't want that rude ai that's no, right. Especially not if it's going to be killing us all. No, Jeez. no. At least have some decorum. Well, <laughs> let's Don't have our own. At the same time. Let's have our own decorum as we jump into the show here. Let's remind everybody you can subscribe to the Twist Podcast, the nice um, kind of structured, knit, tightly knit version of the show on all of your mm -hmm. favorite podcast platforms. And you can also watch us on YouTube, Facebook, all the places you can find videos like that just search twist i'm sure you can find it this week in science out there in the internet ethers all right justin are you ready to to do some science to chat let's, about some science let's go let's okay. go all right what do you got for me at the head of the show oh tonight? yeah 
Let's see. Yeah, I guess that means I'm uh, up first here. Oh yeah, here yeah. we go. Uh, I'm going to start with the the, the most terrifying uh, article I've ever read. Okay, this that's is, yeah. You're setting is, yourself up here for sure. Okay, this is a quote. It's one of those things we wish we could disinvent. Now that's not a quote from the the story. That's actually from uh, Nick Cage's character Sam Go- Goodspeed in the movie The Rock. The Rock, yes. yes. So it's about us. He's talking about a substance called VX, which is short for Venomous Agent X, which is a nerve agent classified as a weapon of mass destruction by the United States and the UN and international bodies everywhere. In the movie, a team of angry militants attempt to use VX and rockets to ransom the city of San Francisco for $100 million. The movie, The Rock, netted over $250 million, proving that threatening the city of San Francisco with VX for cash works, but is much safer and more profitable to do so virtually. Which brings us to the Swiss Federal Institute for Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Protection Convention earlier this month and one of their uh, invited presenters. The invited presenter was Collaborations Pharmaceuticals, a small company, private company. And uh, Collaborations Pharmaceuticals was invited to speak on the potential ramifications of AI-assisted drug research. Now, Collaborations had previously designed a commercial molecule generator, which used machine learning uh, to make model predictions of bioactivity to find safer molecules that would be targets uh, that could, you could use uh, to target human disease. So they're doing good research. And the models that they have in their AI penalize for predicted text toxicity and reward uh, target activity. So at first, uh, collaborations pharmaceuticals didn't probably know what to make of this invitation. Uh, They have no experience in weaponizing artificial intelligence or using it for bad purposes. They thought about it though, because they're scientists and they're clever, uh, clever folks. So they attempted to weaponize their own AI systems to see what would happen. Basically, they just inverted the logic of the AI so that it would start rewarding toxic bioactivity instead of penalizing it. Uh, Using data from the same public databases they would ordinarily be using to help derive compounds for the treatment of neurological diseases, it took less than six hours for the model to generate 40,000 molecules that scored high in toxicity. In the process, the AI designed not only VX, but also many other known chemical warfare agents. Many new molecules were also designed that looked equally plausible as a chemical warfare weapon of mass destruction. These new molecules were produced, were predicted, not produced. Nothing was produced. They didn't make anything. But the new (laughs) molecules were predicted actually to be more toxic than any known chemical warfare agents. Orders of magnitude more toxic than VX, which can already kill a human with an amount about the size of a grain of sand. And the results were completely unexpected because the data sets they were using, too, were not some dark lab secret formula of molecules that exist on the planet. They were using public data sets, include nerve agents. There may have been insecticides and normal drugs that people use, but these are all commercially available molecules that were in this database. In fact, a lot of their virtual molecules had entirely separate properties from the many thousands of molecules in the model and the data that they were feeding it. So this this AI system actually built new molecules Mm -hmm. completely different than what was in what was even in the public data set. So the, the, yeah, the better AI can predict toxicity to avoid, uh, it says somewhere in the article there, the better it simultaneously is at discovering right. lethal molecules. Sure, sure. So the next step is actually, is actually making a compound out of this knowledge, which is really hard if you want to uh, make any of the known chemical warfare agents because there's all sorts of international controls, lists of watched and controlled precursor chemicals even. So even the chemicals you would need to make the chemicals, you would need to make the thing 
are on these lists and if they're getting purchased or moved, international community is trying to keep an eye on all of this. But what if the new chemicals, what if, what if, what if the, something that the AI has found uses a completely different list of precursors? Then all of those lists of, of watched precursors mean nothing. All the all those safeguards that we have uh, employed on an international level out the window. So as cl uh, Collaborations Pharmaceuticals points out, they are just one very small private company amongst hundreds who have this capability. The genie is already out of the mm -hmm. medicine bottle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So machine learning can already do this. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of what that, I was going to ask is it doesn't seem that far away from stuff that we've done in the past. Yeah, and they're pointing out that, you know, while theirs is a, a commercial product, meaning it's it's designed and built to be used by large companies that presumably have some sort of safeguards in place, there's plenty of also open source software tools. And again, they used public data sets. So it's not like they were using private knowledge to begin with. So their fear is that this could go on without any oversight. Uh, Scientists, so, yeah. So this is like this is the most terrifying article I've I've ever read. Scientists uh, also need to ensure that the misuse of AI is prevented and that the tools and models developed are only used for good. Problem is, how, how do you do, you do that? that? Yeah. <laughs> so that's oh my gosh. Well, so this is without getting on my capitalism high horse so quickly in the show. Uh, oh. This is where medicine being a capitalist venture is a problem. It's been a problem with, you know, far, part of fighting COVID because you don't want to have people kind of fighting for the sole propriety of cures when we're in a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. But similarly, you, you don't want this AI, quote unquote, to fall into the wrong hands. <laughs> yeah, but like, okay, well, here's... there's money to be gained, right? That's the that's the fear. But here's the thing, though. That, like, that's I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I quite follow you there because a lot of the software that exists has been open sourced for yeah. public use to sort of find without the profit motive. I'm saying so. So the there's no so, profit motive with the AI, but there's a profit motive. Candy. Too. With yeah. the drugs the AI could come up with or discover, or the need for drugs that this AI could create if it yeah. goes the wrong way, right? And so and that's is... kind of what I mean is that the whole idea of pharmaceuticals being a profit based system mm -hmm. feeds into this potentially being used for the wrong reasons. <laughs> I would I would love to jump on an anti capitalist high horse with you, not on this one. Because really? Part of what, that's well, part of what part of what use of AI is, is, is being targeted for is all of these small diseases that don't have enough people to get behind them, like a breast cancer, like a colon cancer. I mean, there's, there's a thousand diseases that have such a small population that is affected and they're heavily affected by them that that profit motive isn't there to come up with the cure because there's not enough people who are going to take it. So using AI to find these molecule targets is like a quick way to avoid all the years of expensive research and try to tackle some of those smaller diseases that don't have the big profit. Mark. Is there profit in business? Yes, there still is. But, but here's the thing. It's too late, right? I mean, hmm. part, of, part of what this would mean to take it under control from the AI side, from the artificial intelligence side, would be aspects of scientific tools certain databases the way that science typically works would be uh, forced to be locked away from the public uh going forward problem is that's going forward and even if that were to happen even if there was a legislation tomorrow that looked at this and said ah we need to you know shut down public access to all these tools it, it was it's still too late uh, the 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 genie the out the pandora's hmm. box is open so on the other hand I think actually uh Gordon in the chat room might have uh already might have already sort of hit on this. Uh another another approach might be to yeah, run it. See what you could make 
and figure out what chemicals you would need. And hopefully they're not, you know, available in a household garage. But then you have other precursors that you can put on those international lists and start to pre uh, preemptively uh, keep those chemicals out of the hands of potential ne'er-do-wellers. Hmm. So, but yeah, it's just a really tough, and, and it's fun because, you know, uh, this is, this is uh, Collaborations Pharmaceuticals. This is a small private company. Get invited to this thing. Don't have anything to bring to the talk and just run this sort of in-house experiment. And they were, <laughs> like, they're terrified. Right. And this is their... This is, Whoops, look for, what we did. Well, but they worked for decades to do this thing that has only best of intentions. And they're like, yeah. oh gosh, Whoopsie. that was way too easy. Way yeah. too easy. Yeah. It's I spilled that that milk into biochemical warfare. Oopsie. Yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, um moving on to uh another actual uh technological marvel in medicine mm -hmm. I brought today. Um, this is from Scripps Research. They've unveiled a new tissue clearing method for rendering large biological samples transparent. So um, tissue clearing involves the use of solvents to remove molecules that make tissue opaque, like fat, so that they can essentially make the tissue optically transparent. They can keep proteins and structures in place as they do that. And so then they can use genetically encoded or antibody linked fluorescent beacons to mark active genes or other molecules in a lab animal. And then in tissue clearing that allows those beacons to be imaged all at once across an entire organ or an entire animal. And so uh, this, it's a really cool process uh, that, that is, is really kind of underutilized in medicine partially because it's really labor intensive it usually is hazardous chemicals mm -hmm. and um they it's it's been difficult to figure out how to do this to large pieces as well um so they this new method uses both organic solvents and water-based solvents the organic solvents so these are usually used separately. The organic solvents mm -hmm. generally work more quickly and more powerfully, but diminish fluorescent signals. So if you're trying to use those markers, that's going to be difficult for your experiment. Methods using water-based solvents, they're better at preserving the fluorescence, but are impractically weak for clearing anything other than brain tissue. So that mm -hmm. means that um, can't really be, be used in other parts of the body. But in this case, they used a sequential combination of organic solvents and water-based detergents to make use of water-based hydrogels to protect molecules within the tissue that need to be preserved. So it's actually kind of a three-step process. And the, the positive thing here also is that it often did not require constant pumping, active pumping of solvents through the sample. They were able to put it in a jar, put it on a shaker, like you'd see at Home Depot, just kind of agitate it. And it would just sit there on the bench top and then eventually it would be ready to go. So this also means it is more practical and scalable in labs that aren't specifically for this. And so let me, I wanna, I wanna show you. So, like the first thing that occurs to me, and I, I, it depends on where it's taking pigment from. If it takes too much, it's no good. But if it's leaving, like, it, this could potentially be huge for pathology labs. Because then instead of getting a slice of a biopsy that's down to a couple microns thick and put onto a slide, you might be able to image a the, the entire piece uh, of a biopsy and, and sort of look uh, throughout the tissue. Uh, for signs of disease, but again, but that's all such a visual, that's such a visual thing to begin with that if I suppose if you took out too much of the, the things that you're trying to look at, it could actually make it harder to do. So I don't know. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to, <laughs> my computer decided it doesn't want to let me share pictures right now. So I'll try to fix that for later. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the tissue is very cool looking. Um, you can check out the show notes on twist.org and click on the link to see the picture here. But um, they were able to take mice 
the whole chests of mice, the entire chest cavity, and image SARS-CoV-2 infected cells in them in a way that you haven't, they haven't holistically been able to do in the past. Yeah, this does have, this has tremendous, uh, then potential as a pathology tool. Oh my goodness. That is my story about making organs clear. <laughs> Antibody uh, linked fluorescent beacons. That is, that is really cool. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. What do you have? You have something about caribou? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. So this is a quick caribou populations across Canada, in case you haven't noticed, which if, unless you're in Canada, you probably haven't noticed. If you're in Canada, my understanding is that most of Canadians live in a, in, in like three or four cities and, and the rest is, uh, there's no Canadians, very few. Uh, caribou populations across Canada have been going down largely due to human activity. And there have been recovery efforts from the federal government, from provincial governments, but they have not been working. Caribou declines have exceeded 40% in recent decades all the way across the country. So there's many populations, subpopulations of caribou that have been lost. They're just gone. And so yeah, time is running out. A new University of British Columbia study finds that with the help of indigenous led conservation initiatives of two First Nation tribes, there is one herd of mountain caribou whose numbers are going up. What tribe elders had remembered as a sea of caribou had declined over the years to only 38 animals uh, back in 2013. Now, uh, nine years later, the count of the herd is over 110 and numbers are on the rise. The conservation and recovery effort involved some short-term actions. They, do, uh, they reduce the exposure the caribou have to predators. And part of the way they do that is they have tribe members assigned to live near the caribou. They're going to go out there in shifts to where the caribou live. Uh, and they also have an active guarding of maternal pens. So when there's females who are pregnant, they're sort of isolated and penned and they're, you know, fed that way. But then they're also prevented from predation in this in this way. So it's a very hands-on thing. Tribe members collect lichen to feed the, those, those mother caribou. Uh, and there's ongoing work for them to secure landscape protection, to actually get protection for the land surrounding the caribou so that the, there's no development or hunting or recreation taking place in the area as well. All of this uh, in the effort to create a self-sustaining caribou population in the future. Researchers note, this is an important part of decolonizing the mindset of conservation, which has historically worked to exclude the views of indigenous people. And I've said it a few times on this show. If you want to conserve nature, if you love nature, go live in a big city. If you want to conserve a nature area, turn it over to the people who value it the most. And in most cases, this means giving lands back to the indigenous populations that have a history of successful stewardship. So if, because all the good contention, uh, excuse, all the, uh, for all the good intentions people may have for nature preserves, uh, the idea of keeping areas wild. If there were people on those lands before colonization, give back the land and get out of the way. <laughs> I wish we could do that pretty universally. Oh, oh, we, we could. <laughs> We really, there's, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of areas we absolutely could do that. You know, cause there was, what was this conversation? There's some conversation we had where there was some proposal of creating this big, uh, nature preserve sort of in the middle of the country in the great plains or something like this, you know, but whenever we've had these things, they're federally protected. There's a, then a federal government come, uh, administration comes and says, oh yeah, it's, it's all going to be pristine wilderness and oil rigs. Hey, no, 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 that wasn't part of the thing. You're changing it. No, we're going to sell off these lands because mm -hmm. we don't need it. No, but that's what, then why did we protect it? Stop trying to protect things federally. Turn them over. 
to the indigenous population that lived in there and stewarded it for many thousands and thousands of years and just and just be take it off of your plate it's not a thing I don't know, it's you know i'm not saying that western societies can't do nature preservation but i i will say they haven't they have not done that that's not a thing nobody goes oh yeah western western society culture greater western society that if you want to preserve nature that's your go-to mm -hmm. right nobody's ever going to make that claim well i will say that in uh certain areas of the united states um, there is a, a push to uh, develop much more collaborative partnerships mm -hmm. with native tribes um, in wild spaces that still exist. So mm -hmm. state parks, county parks, um, even a lot of the national parks, they are starting to reach out to their local tribes to learn from them and to also give give some of the stewardship back and give them their props. And I, I know in, in your woods, for example, they're, um, they're actually revamping all of their signage to try to take out a lot of the kind of white savior lens that are on a lot of them and yeah. speak more truth to the history and the, the impact of the native peoples, the positive impact um, on the, on the land before we moved in and decided to do things our own way. Yeah, and and you know the uh, to that too. I I think that learning from the tribes is a good idea, but it really, it's you can still learn what they're doing after you've given the land back, mm -hmm. after you've 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 handed it over. If you've not if if the U.S. government is not going to be a good steward of lands, or the Canadian government is not going to be a good steward of lands, it should just recognize that's not the wheelhouse. Turn it over. Justin, it, baby steps. <laughs> I know it's no, frustrating, no, but this no is definitely steps. a situation where, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, this conversation wasn't really happening at the level it was happening. The The narrative is changing and the, the trajectory is moving. And I think that's good. Yes, I wish it will continue. I hope that it will continue. But already this is a huge turnaround from how things were not that long ago in terms of wild spaces in North America. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to what's coming next. Um, speaking of what's coming next, do you want to talk about the latest with COVID? <laughs> oh, that sounds like a fun subject. Yeah, so if you just tuned, tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science with Justin Jackson and myself, Blair Bazdrich. Dr. Kiki is off tonight, but we still have ourselves a COVID update. So um, I wanted to talk about the latest nasal spray that uh, came out in the news this week. So a nasal spray from Cornell University, a study at Cornell University looked at a nasal spray that could not only potentially prevent COVID-19 illness, prior to exposure, but also provide early treatment if it is administered soon after infection, which it's a respiratory illness. So putting it right in the source kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, so this was mice engineered with human receptors for the coronavirus on their cell surfaces. They found the molecule N0385 inhibited entry of the virus into cells. They also showed that it protected mice from infection prior to exposure, while also providing effective treatment when administered up to 12 hours after exposure. So one of the things that, that they mentioned is, you know, if you had enough of this and every time you think you might have been exposed, you give yourself a little spritz, right? You're pretty well protected. It works early on in the effect infection. Even if you've already been infected, it's, it's a good barrier immediately after infection. They tested mice exposed to the first strain detected in Washington state in 2020. And they also detect, they looked at the Delta strain. It has not yet been tested on Omicron. The way that they tracked if it got them sick or not was looking at weight and um, other clinical and pathological measurements. But weight is a good tracker of just, do you, as a mouse, feel sick from COVID, right? And so they also looked at temperature, they looked at mortality, of course, and then um, they looked at tissue analysis to understand what was happening internally. They, um, giving them the nasal spray prevented them from losing weight prior to exposure and from dying post-infection. Yeah. It's, you know, that's, uh, 
there's sort of an awkward moment when so i went out for the first time went out for like went out out to a thing with people in a building in a public space uh to watch this uh book uh roll out talk uh, about neanderthals mm -hmm. couldn't resist right the first human in the in the world in an enclosed space that I encounter, sneezed on you. Immediately coughed. Oh, okay. <laughs> like the first humor was <clears throat> doing one of these, and I'm like, I you you're the first. Is it everyone? Because I haven't been interacting with these humans. Are you? Is it everyone, or is it just you? Because now I don't know. But I just was picturing, based on your story, that there'd be this awkward moment where somebody just maybe innocently coughs or whatever, but then you like reach into the pocket. Pull back the mask. And then yeah. they, of course, they can't go unnoticed. So they're like, uh, I have allergies. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You Now you talked. I'm going to have to do it again. <laughs> like, I mean, hey, I do it. This sort of slight, slight, so seeming, uh, seemingly slight social judgment of others. Well, if when we're going go to continue reinitiating social situations while there's still a global pandemic, God. there's going to be gaffes, right? Um, but so this this study, just to let you know, um, it is uh, currently now uh, in the fundraising phase in the hope that they can do human trials, drug development, mm -hmm. formulation, and of course, last mass production. The hope is that treatment could be submitted to the FDA for emergency use approval, within a minimum of six months. So by the end of this year, you might have your COVID nasal spray ready to go. All right, yeah. Yeah, and then I see there's some stories here about which vaccine is best. Did you bring those, Justin? Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is a pretty quick one. It wasn't that, it wasn't as thorough uh, looking as a test as I would like, but uh, yeah, question it uh, comes up every once in a while. Which COVID vaccine is best? And, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> right. That's the classic answer. It doesn't matter. You know, you get a lot of team Pfizer, team Moderna folks out there making claims, trash talk and the other about which one is best. Meanwhile, the Johnson & Johnson people are always saying, doesn't matter. Not a competition. So they did a head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head -to -head uh, comparison. Uh, it was conducted uh, between all three, as well as Novavax, which yeah. is being developed just in time to maybe a, be a second or third booster shot. It's like it, it like came in late, uh, but is is ready soon ish, I think. So this is an as of yet uh, peer reviewed study that assessed the four vaccines using 14 metrics, including levels of several types of immune cells, such as T cells and B cells, as, as well as immune molecules called neutralizing antibodies. Previous comparisons that have been done between the vaccines have often used data sets from different studies and then kind of try to compare them across studies, which is doable, but can also, you know, if you have different laboratory techniques or different things that they're looking at in, spe in specific, can be can be a little tricky to really get this uh, comparison. So for the latest study, researchers applied the same techniques across all the vaccines that they investigated within a, a single study. And they found that antibody levels induced by two doses of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, they, they dropped substantially over six months. In contrast, antibody levels from J&J's one-shot vaccine were stable or even increased over time. So the the J&J shot was, uh, you know, you got your shot and you got the, your protection and it might have even gotten better. Whereas anybody with Pfizer or Moderna, their, their uh, protection dropped substantially as he went closer to that six-month point. However, okay, so J and J's best is what you're saying. However, the increased antibody levels measured six months after vaccination with J and J were still lower than those observed six months after vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna. It was just less effective all the way through. Uh, Novavax's two-shot regimen 
uh, induced antibody response on par with those of uh, the mRNA vaccines. However, they had some weird, there was a one weird thing. There was levels of CD8 plus T cells. These are the T cells that destroy infected cells. And they were low to undetectable, which is maybe a red flag, maybe not. The other three vaccines performed very well in that metric, so it was sort of an outlier there. Um, anyway, researchers say that they don't intend to proclaim winner or losers. Uh, this is not a competition. This is not bragging rights or anything like that. This is not to elevate or reduce your sense of protection, at least until all the people with the J&J shot have left the room. Uh, Har- Harvard study from late last year did find Moderna to be slightly better than Pfizer. Compared to those who received the Moderna vaccine, recipients of the Pfizer vaccine had a 27% higher risk of documented SARS-CoV-2 infections and a 70% higher risk of COVID-19 hospitalization than the folks who had gotten the Moderna. But Keep in mind, that's in compared to those percentages of higher uh, sound pretty big. 27% higher risk of getting the infection, 70% higher risk of hospitalization. But that's just of the percentage that didn't get it and isn't actually that big of a number of people since both of the vaccines were over 90% effective, Mm -hmm. well over 90% effective. And so you're doing a comparison Mm -hmm. with the slim number of breakthroughs. It's a percent of a percent of a percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is also, this came out, the the one you're referencing from last year, around a bunch of other studies that said Mm -hmm. other things. And that's what I noticed about the the story that you brought this week that's not yet peer-reviewed, is Mm -hmm. they called this the first apples to apples version, (laughs) where they actually compared them all kind of in a lab um, through a direct study. And all the rest were just kind of, survey-based data that right. was Which not I almost almost didn't bring this study because yeah. of that because they yeah. said the other studies were like comparing apples and oranges and i went so they were almost exactly the same right 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 <laughs> but, but yeah so i remember this because when i was getting my booster i was deciding do i go moderna do i go pfizer and i was trying to read all these different studies yeah. and there were studies saying Moderna was better. There were studies saying Pfizer was better and the percentages were very similar, but they were studying different pieces of efficacy in different ways and different subsets of population. Like for example, consider the fact that Pfizer was approved first and who got the vaccine first? People who are older and people with um, immunodeficiencies or other medical compromising things to consider. So if just generally speaking, those people were more likely to get Pfizer, that could mean that those people had higher levels of mortality or hospitalization. So that is the problem, right? Is there's no vacuum of this data. There is no completely variable controlled version of of comparing these vaccines unless you start from the beginning with all of them. Yeah. And there's, uh, yeah. And there's also like, uh, in looking at this, there's one thing that was saying, you know, uh, Pfizer's 96% uh, chance of preventing, whereas uh, uh, Moderna was only 95 or like, but yeah, you're right. You're, you're pulling data out of the live stream of humanity. And so uh, in some ways that makes it difficult. On the other hand, you got your sample size. Boy, do you have a sample size. So on some level, even if your data sets aren't precise, they're probably still accurate because of of the volume uh, that's out there. Right. Unless what I said has any sway on it. (laughs) <laughs> Which no end end with end with what you say uh, having sweet like it's a little of both it's a little of yeah, both you're yeah. you're both you're you're both uh, dealing with a, a moving target with it's mm-hmm. especially when any time you're dealing with humans so, but I, I think what's sort of interesting would be to randomize a trial where mm-hmm. you say like okay say we got we've got uh, we've picked twenty cities. And we just are counties or whatever. And we just want to see what went on in those counties. And, and, and then of those, pick a few and see if they're consistent. 
and just randomly pick like three of those 20 and see if there's a consistency or a big inconsistency in them and do that a couple of times uh, to see if there are geographical differences, if there's medical, because that's also, that's also a possibility. I mean, we know healthcare isn't uniform across <laughs> the United States. Yeah. You know, well, that is the other issue, right? Is you're much more likely to die from COVID if you, if there's not ICU space where you live. Ugh. So it's definitely, it's they, those two pieces influence each other, likelihood of hospitalization and likelihood of death in a weird way. There's kind of a push pull where those influence each other too. But anyway, Makes there's sense. no study that's perfect to, to compare these vaccines yet. Uh, they all seem to work well. So if you are still not boosted or vaccinated, hopefully everyone's vaccinated, but even if you're not boosted, just go get whichever one. Just go get whichever one. It's fine. It'll do it. It'll protect you. Um, okay. And uh, moving on into the next part of the show, I want to thank everyone for listening to This Week in Science with normally Dr. Kiki, Justin Jackson, and myself, Blair Bazdurich. Dr. Kiki is off tonight, but thank you for joining us anyway without the good doctor. Um, I want to remind you all that we can bring you all of this amazing science because of you. So if you want to help support us, you can go to twist.org and click on the Patreon link and support us at different levels. Just something to remind you all about. Moving hmm. on. Do you know what time it is, Justin? Is it that time? It's that time. What time is it? Is it time for Blair's Animal Corner? It is. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? <gasps> oh my gosh, I have so much good stuff. Okay, so first... First, I'm going to tell you about fruit fly sperm. Fruit fly sperm again? Yes. Once again, it's time to discuss fruit fly sperm in Blair's Animal Corner. This is a study also out of Cornell. I think this is my second Cornell study of the evening. They were busy this week. They found that four days after a sperm enters a female fruit fly, close to 20% of its proteins are female derived <gasps> what's happening to this sperm after it enters a female right. seminal fluid proteins and then female proteins bind to sperm inside the female's body hmm. some of the proteins attaching to sperm are metabolic enzymes which lead research to believe that they may be supporting the sperm's viability propagating them like a beautiful fern in your home. <laughs> so in flies and in many other animals, sperm live for many days inside the female. So how does that sperm survive without degrading for those many days before it can be used? It looks like the female may be providing enzymes they need to keep them nourished and healthy. Although sperm come from the male and are comprised of male DNA and cellular structures, there's, you know, there's also this expectation that the female body is a hostile environment for sperm. There's this expectation that that's why sperm doesn't last very long in the female body is that the sperm come from the male, they are foreign DNA, and the female body attacks it. Yeah. But in fact, it looks like the female body is adopting and nurturing that sperm. Hmm. The, the reproduction could fail ultimately if the, if the female did not nurture that sperm and the sperm died too quickly inside the female body. So once inside that female, the sperm slowly becomes less and less male. Just DNA speaking, just because of all these other enzymes and things that bind to the, to the sperm. So in yeah, evolutionarily, I would, I would assume, yeah, go ahead. Well, I would assume too then if, Potentially, if you had a uh, malformed, ill-fitted, uh, mutated, like a, an unhealthy sperm, mm -hmm. 
then perhaps you might not have the right binding site or location for these enzymes. Possible. And and in a way that also becomes uh, a filter for making a better egg. Absolutely, that's possible. Egg. Yeah. So I know the other thing about um, ill-formed, incomplete, misshapen sperm, not to be insulting to them, um, is that they are usually slow and bad at moving. And so even if you do live for up to four days, even if the female body can nurture and keep that sperm alive for that long, it will not make it to the egg because it is not shaped right to swim properly. So, so you're right. That could be something that could happen, but also there's, that's kind of the fail safe evolutionarily, but you can see how this could be an evolutionary benefit and a, a case of cooperation between the male and the female to make reproduction successful. You think about the fact that um, it depends on the organism, but dependent on how many eggs are released, how often they're released, all these sorts of things could impact the exact timing being right when you're dealing with internal fertilization. And so being able to propagate that sperm and keep it going is to make sure that copulation is not wasted. So it's, I think it's interesting in the context of the previous narrative of the female body being a hostile environment, that actually it's the exact opposite. The female body is kind of encasing and, 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 and helping the sperm survive as long as it can. <laughs> kind of the exact yeah. opposite. Yeah. Well, there's a, there seems to be, and I don't know where it comes from, a very long history of putting negative context on female reproduction. Oh, of course. I don't know. It's because people that fear what they do not understand. That is my guess, is because you think about what is very evident and um, visible to the naked eye and um, easy to interpret in the male reproductive system, in the female reproductive system, it's it's all internal. It's a lot of it is. It's uh some of it's microscopic, <laughs> and it's yes. I think it's a, a fear of what you don't understand. It's why some members of Congress thought that you could reach a baby through the throat, right? It's it's a it's a myst mystification of of how the internal processes work. But now now we understand a little bit more. That the, I'm guess, I'm just gonna guess though that that was not a woman. It was not. You're uh -huh. right. Wow. I'm yeah, good this at guessing. is this is back to a couple weeks ago near Valentine's Day. Had a story about sex education in schools and how um, having it early and positive base focused on pleasure and also co-ed and all these things are very and helpful. Just facts. And I'm just 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 starting even with facts. Yeah. Just biological anatomy and facts can also apparently then be helpful to future Congress people. Oh gosh. Oh boy. Anyway, uh, moving on from from this very strange topic about sperm, let's move on to snakes. Squeezing snakes. Snakes like to squeeze. Oh. Some of them oh. do. What do you call snakes that squeeze? Squeezer snakes. What do you call them? <laughs> constrictors? That's right. Pop quiz passed. No. So <laughs> constrictors, they squeeze their victims before swallowing them whole what do you think actually might be a challenge with the constriction process and you know being a living breathing animal oh uh right you would have to have some sort of reinforcement because you're also constricting yourself yeah at the same so time. i'll tell everyone listening and watching you can put your hands on your uh your chest or just below your chest around your rib cage and take a deep breath in and out and in and out so as opposed to how you might imagine it in like a cartoon you breathe in you get bigger you breathe out you contract right actually our rib cage works the opposite because we have a diaphragm so when we breathe in we actually lengthen and when we breathe out, I did that, the rib I did cage that actually even expands. Yeah. yeah. So when we, if we, like a, a mammal in the grips of a snake, 
We're being constricted. We would breathe in, couldn't breathe out anymore, and we'd breathe in, and we couldn't breathe out anymore, and we'd breathe in, and we couldn't breathe out anymore because they tighten each time, right? So that's how constriction works. It's not a big, strong squeeze, like a strangula strangulation until you're dead sort of thing. It's a, it's a slow... Um, taking advantage of the of the movements we take when we breathe mm -hmm. but on the opposite end the snake also has to breathe while they are constricting how do they do that now you may or may not know snakes do not have a diaphragm they rely on muscles attached to their ribs so they actually move their ribs and that holes that creates kind of a suction so they can breathe in and then out so they have this completely different process where it's all controlled by the ribs so how especially if it has to do with the ribs how do they continue to breathe effectively while they are squeezing their little hearts out to get their dinner this is something that had to have been figured out millions of years ago when snakes first started squeezing. So this is something that um, that has been an unsolved mystery to us humans, but has been a solved mystery to snakes for a very long time. So no one until now has monitored the detail of breathing patterns and the mechanics of breathing patterns in snakes in the act of constricting a prey item. So this is from uh, Brown University. And the researchers... Um, attached metal markers to two ribs in each reptile, one third of the way down the snake's body and another halfway along to visualize the ribs in x-rays. And then they put blood pressure cuffs over the ribs in both regions, gradually increasing the pressure on one or the other. So this was supposed to mimic what happens when they are doing a constricting motion. Hmm. And so either um, they didn't mind the cuff at all, or if they got defensive and hissed, that was actually an excellent opportunity to study breathing because you take a big breath before you hiss. <laughs> so either way, they got some good data. Um, so what they found was that the hind section of the lungs works like a bellows, pulling air into the lung when the ribs further forward can't move. So they actually um, move one part of their ribs instead of the other. The question is, are they just trying to move all the ribs and one area is immobilized? Or are they selectively deciding to move a certain portion of their ribs, you know, by reflex or whatever? But are, are the, the signals from their brain telling only parts of their ribs to move when they are constricted? It's they were able to figure out that they were in fact able to control the movements of the ribs in different portions of their rib cages independently. When they were gripped by the blood pressure cuff a third of the way along, they breathe using, using the ribs further back. And then when they did the ones further back, the ones up front switched to drawing in air. Okay. So there, now I've got, I've got a couple of questions. Yes. So that's okay. So that makes sense in a way. That means the, the snake could keep breathing for parts of the ribcage could could enact the motion required for breathing, even though part other parts of the ribcage are engaging. Yeah. But how long are a snake's lungs? Or where, like? Oh, so how, so. Oh my gosh. Because I'm just. I, I'll have to do like a short a, sometime. These little snake on lungs up at the snake front. Snake It doesn't matter what goes on in the back. So but I have I'm, no idea. I'm so glad you asked. You know what? I'm going to pull up a picture. So you okay, can here we see go. the stomach, you see the left lung is yeah. small in between the heart and the trachea, very, very tiny. Right lung curves all the way from the trachea wow. down to like the, the lower intestine, the small intestine area. So um, I guess it's the upper, but the stomach. Yeah. So this is, it goes like more than halfway down the snake. Yeah. The the lung is huge. So this makes sense if you have ribs that go all the way down to where the tail starts, mm -hmm. that you could move different ribs at different times to make this work. The way they could figure out this was a deliberate movement of one or the other is that the ribs at the far end of the lungs only moved when the forward ribs were gripped. So there wasn't a universal movement across the entire length of the snake when they weren't constricted at all. The, the back end of the snake 
the the ribs didn't move at all when they were free. But as soon as you constricted the front, the back goes, oh, I got to do it now. My turn. Mm. So then it starts constricting or um, uh, pulling the ribs out. Yeah, yeah expanding to, to kind of force air into the lung. Mm, they clever. also filmed and recorded nerve signals controlling the rib muscles when constricted by the blood pressure cuff. And so um, that's the other way they could definitely confirm there were no nerve signals in the constricted muscles. There were only nerve signals in the muscles where the ribs were moving to help with breathing. So confirmed, that's what's going on. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and now I will round out the animal corner with a late breaking story from uh, a Twitter user named Jack Jackson Fly, I do believe. <gasps> oh. <laughs> um, so this is a study all about orb weaver spiders. So I can't imagine why you sent this to me, Justin. Mm -hmm. But this is a really interesting study looking at how spiders might be able to use their webs to help them hear. But this is actually a study more than that. That's that's kind of what I saw the, um, the headline as in mm -hmm. many different outlets. But the majority of the study is just about whether spiders have ears at all. <laughs> and that's really what I think is interesting about this. This is from Birmingham, Berm, B sorry, Binghamton. I wonder why I had trouble with that. Binghamton University's Thomas J. Watson College of Engineering and Applied Science. That place <laughs> looked at orb weaving spiders and wanted to see if they could use their webs as extended auditory arrays but also if they could just respond to sound still unclear whether insects and arthropods can detect sounds how they detect them and how much they use them in their lives so they wanted to see uh if they would respond with different vibrations different sounds in different ways they built an anechoic chamber, which if you break it down, makes sense, a completely soundproof room, which is a fancy way of saying that. They collected orb weavers from the windows around campus, handy. Mm. <laughs> they had the spider spin a web inside a rectangular frame, not too difficult. A lot of orb weavers build their web every morning, fresh. And then they positioned it where they wanted based on which part of the study they were doing. They used pure tone sound three meters away at different sound levels to see if the spiders responded. Spiders can respond to sound levels as low as 68 decibels. For louder sound, they found even more types of behaviors. So um, for human hearing, decibels are between zero and 140. So it's, it's within human hearing is what we're talking about here, which is cool. Um, then they place the sound source at a 45 degree angle. See if they behave differently. They did. They not only responded to the sound, but they could tell where it was coming from. They would adjust themselves accordingly based on the hmm. direction the sound was coming from with 100% accuracy. Ah, wow. Yes. Then they wanted to see if these spiders can hear better with their webs or if they ever use their webs as something to help channel sound and listen. They use labor vibrometry. They measured over 1,000 locations on a natural spider web with a spider sitting in the center under the sound field. And they showed that the web moves with sound at almost maximum physical efficiency across an ultra wide frequency range. Hmm. If the web is moving like that, is the spider using it? They placed a mini speaker five centimeters away from the center of the web where the spider sits and two millimeters away from the web, close but not touching. The sound wave from the mini speaker died out significantly as it traveled through the air, but it propagated readily through the web with little attenuation. So it didn't um, degrade at all as it moved through the web. Still at around 68 decibels when it reached the spider. So this is not um, an enhanced range of sound. They found four out of the 12 spiders responded to the web-borne signal. So they, it seems like they can hear through the webs, but it doesn't seem like they're sp particularly attuned to it. So <clears throat> what was the sound they were playing, though? It was just a tonal sound. I think right. they were more interested in, is the, is the web the, vibrating? Here, because, yeah. because I'd be very interested <laughs> to know if, like, 
We know that uh, we learned uh, last year, or year before, maybe that that certain flowers can hear mm -hmm. that uh, bees buzzing. The sound of bees buzzing is enough for them to upregulate sugar production, so that the scent gets out there, so they can attract the bee. I was, I'd be very curious if, like, the the sound of a fly, like, got their attention more right. through the web, or That's but then it's just, yeah, you know, because because it seems like there would be a great advantage if you're, you know, if you're a spider and you're going about your day and you're doing some some web mending or maybe sleeping. I don't know if spiders sleep. Yeah, of maybe course they taking sleep. a nap. Yeah, and they then, sleep. Bzz, you hear that. Maybe you hear it even better through the web, and then you're like, oh. Got to wake up, got to get a cup of spider coffee so I can be ready in case something runs into the way. I need to get there quick. I don't want it to take, you know, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. So, so the other really interesting thing in this is that, um, it, it appears that spiders know how to play string instruments. So by crouching or stretching, spiders could change the tension of the silk strands tuning them to pick up different frequencies oh wow so it seems like they can customize their web to hear different sorts of sounds they would like to do future experiments to investigate how spiders can use sound they detect using their web but they also want to test whether other types of web weaving spiders also use their silk to outsource their hearing now four out of 12 spiders using their web responding to sound through the web does not sound like for sure spiders are using this. So th this study more found out that it's possible that different frequencies of sound were maintained throughout the web at different frequencies, depending on how the spider was moving in the web. So it's possible. We don't know how right. widely it is used and how it is used. And I think this is where Justin, you, you kind of brought up a really good point, which is you have to make it worthy of their attention. Because they're dealing with all sorts of crazy loud sounds coming from other animals, plants, and us humans. And so why would they pay any attention to just um, the stereo next door if yeah. you're playing it through a speaker and it's a tonal sound? And, and this is also where one of those things where, where the scientific method, uh, at the end of an experiment, uh, you now have other questions and mm -hmm. you, you create a new experiment to test those. I now want to study these uh, these twelve spiders, and and see if they're building their webs differently. Because, like you say, uh, like you have uh, just brought up, uh, they can attune them yeah. by the, the by the are the are the webs were the is it not have not the spider, but is it the tuning of the web by the individual spider that made the difference about whether or not they heard the tone through the web? Are there certain spiders of a certain maturity that make a differently tuned web? Oh, I'm not going to make that big. I don't want to hear that that one tone because that means it'll be too big a fly for me anyway. So mm -hmm. why bother making that? Or, ah, that's too small of a meal. Why would I make that thin? Like, whatever the thing is. Uh, now I want to study those webs made by those spiders to see if there's any differences there that also could have played it. Ah, it's a whole complicated thing that then you have to look at, but very fascinating. Yeah. Well, my favorite thing, my favorite quote from this uh, article is about kind of that bigger question. Um, this is from Jun Peng Lei, a current PhD student in the lab. Uh, she uh, said, there could even be a hidden ear within the spider body that we don't know about. So this goes back to that initial question of, do arthropods hear? How do they hear? How do they process that sound? What sounds are important to that, right? So there's just, before you even get into the crazy specifics of if they use the web to hear, take a step back and ask the question, do spiders hear? Which now we, for sure they do, but how? Yeah. So, so I, I'm, uh, don't know, of course, and I have yeah. no idea, but, uh, you know, they are tuned to vibrations that take place within a web. That much we know. If a spider actually hits the web, they can definitely feel the vibration within the web. 
Not a huge jump then for something as light as an orb spider to be able to sense vibration through the air because that's all sound is anyway. And then, you know, my then I would be, sus my new sus suspicion is since we have hairs in our ear that vibrate at different frequencies. And spiders are such hairy little creatures. I mean, they yeah. might not think of a spider's hair. We look up close and they're just covered oh, yeah. in hairy uh, things. Uh, you know, maybe the vibration uh, is taking place there, is getting picked up there. That's what I would I would look at. I would I would have to first. You start with a hairless spider. <laughs> and you, you engineer a hairless spider, and you can, see, and then you do that the experiment with these orb spiders again, and see if it can hear. And if it stops hearing, then you know, aha, I have narrowed it down. At least it's possible that it has something to do. With the hairy cover. Well, yeah, look at that hairy guy. He's yeah. covered with This is a jumping vibrant. spider. That's a jumping spider. Still... It's covered with hairy stuff. Oh, it's covered a cute with jumping hair. Too. But look yeah. at that level. Even the plant is covered with uh, yeah. Oh, and yeah, actually, that would make sense. and actually, you know, we've got this system. I mean, we have uh binocular audio. Is that a thing? Can you say it that it's but one says ocular? That can't be That's what it is. Stereo. Stereo. <laughs> yeah. We call it stereo. Yeah, is that what that means? I've always wondered. Okay. So when we're using our high fidelity ears. Yeah. With our stereo hearing and things are. The little hairs that get vibrated are deep inside that ear. So it has to get if you're a spider and, and if this is all now speculation, I we should I should stop heading down the speculative path. But if you have if you hair on one side of your body is reacting to sound more than hair on the other side, that would be very directional. Like that would really give you the ability to tell where sound might be coming from as opposed yeah. to other sorts of hearing, if that's how they're doing it. Now we just yeah. need a bald spider uh, for an experiment. Right, right, right. right. And as, as Gord asked in the chat room, are web, web building spiders less hairy than, than other spiders because they use their webs? Well, um, I don't know for sure the answer to that, but tarantulas are very hairy. Uh, a lot of tarantulas do not mm -hmm. have webs um, or they are uh, terrestrial based, even if they do have webs. Jumping spiders, a lot of them do not sit on webs and they are hairy. So I don't know. Very interesting. And yes, uh, a couple of people also in the YouTube chat room corrected me. Yes, stereo, I think gets the point across, but the actual term is binaural. Ah. There you go. That's the. I'm gonna pretend that that's the word I was trying to think of. Yeah, that was the word. Me. No, uh, no, it wasn't. I don't know that word. Uh -huh. I'm gonna pretend like I did know the word and just lost it for a second. Yeah, yeah, but no. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's Blair's Animal Corner. Um, hey, are you interested in a T-shirt or a mug or another item of Twist merchandise? Maybe some of our face masks. Seems like we're gonna be wearing those for a while. <laughs> Go to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link to browse our store. Justin. Uh, quick question. Do yes. we actually know if our face masks that were selling through our store are 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 those any good? Or yeah, do you have yeah, to yeah. Wear they're they're, an M95 they're double layers. So it's it's just like any other cloth mask for best it's protection these mask. days. Okay. Days you can put um a surgical mask or an N95 underneath it. I yeah, it's, I do surgical mask and cloth mask most days is how I get around. So okay. those they would be perfect for that. All right. So it's a, a fashion cover, like a, a mask cozy, if you will. It is. It's also better than wearing a surgical mask alone. It is more effective. Okay, there you go. What science stories do you have left, Justin? I, I don't know. Oh, okay, I do know. I do know. So this is kind of fun because this story, uh, I also brought a sort of snake story. Yes. Uh, ladies, it has a little intro -y thing there. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the eighth wonder of the world. Step behind the curtain and behold a freak of nature, an evidence of evolution, a bygone of a bipedal area, the one, the only eight-toed, two-legged snake. Okay, it's not really a snake. But this is a sideshow. It's a pre-snake? Is that the this deal? This is a sideshow barker gotta eat situation. So the, step right up, everybody. Look, this is, yeah, it's it's not a pre-snake either. Mm. So the everywhere I've seen it's like a, a two-legged snake, but it's it turns out it's not really a two-legged snake. Researchers 
with the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution, University of Calgary, and Carleton University have discovered a two-legged snake-like creature. Okay. As uh, many may or may not know, snakes do not have legs. That's a that's a snake characteristic. Some, some, I think even including boa constrictors, do have vestigial toes that can be found uh, in, the, in the skeletal remains, uh, which is a reminder of a time way back when they actually had legs. The theory of snake evolution is that snakes just had four legs like all sorts of other animals that were crawling around. They were lizards, we would have called it back then. You would just say, ah, it's a lizard. And then over time, they gave up their legs to become snakes. It's a decision evolution allows you to make over vast periods of time. Uh, this is published in the journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. This, this fossil discovery is believed to represent both a new genus and species belonging to a group known as Molgophids. Something I've never heard of before. It was approximately 10 centimeters in length, had no forelimbs whatsoever, didn't have a pectoral girdle, the thing I think snakes have. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it did, however, have hind legs. So these are not just toes, but this is hind legs that had feet, and there were four toes on each of these feet which is a very interesting creature to be elongated like a snake, have uh, no four, four arms, legs like a snake, but then to have basically looking, appears to have intact rear legs. Researchers found two of these fossilized specimens in rocks in the Francis Creek Shale in Illinois, which is good because uh, if they found just one, less likely that you come to the conclusion that you've got a two-legged snake-like creature and more you think that uh, you're missing some because of the way it was fossilized, something of this nature. Uh, you might just have an incomplete specimen. The fact that they have multiples that are kind of showing the same thing uh, looks like much more of a, of a hit for a two-legged snake-like creature. The fossil uh, specimens are believed to be approximately like 308 million years old. And I looked at this earlier, but I don't have it you now. I think snakes were uh, thought to have evolved into snakes about a hundred million years ago. I might, that might be off. It might be longer than that. Uh, but this is this is really old, three hundred eight million years old. The researchers also have found indentations in the rock around the fossil. They believe these were made by soft body parts of the creature, and they showed that it had a round snout uh, and nothing in the parts of the body where four limbs might have existed so research oh yeah well, so what are these closest related to in modern so that's the thing it's a new species a new genus so i don't even know if there's hmm. there might not be anything research suggests the loss of forelimbs indicate the creature relied primarily on side winding which is mm -hmm. thing some snakes do as a means of uh locomotion they also note that this ancient creature, while not actually an ancestor of modern snakes, might still help scientists learn more about how snakes might have lost their limbs. Because as one of these sort of rare transitional uh, moments in evolution, you can, you can sort of see what processes might have come before others. And, like the locomotion of sidewinding uh coming ahead of even losing the rear legs which i guess you know you'd have to have some way of getting around if you're going to get rid of your legs yeah you better have something else already planned out <laughs> so the the thing about this i think that it's important to remember too is that legless lizards exist <laughs> and that they also lost their limb well quote yeah lost their limbs um it, separately from snakes they are they are not closely related to snakes and so you can see that in the modern kind of fossil record you can see them losing their legs and you see uh, similar animal skinks who are closely related to legless lizards who have teeny tiny little arms they got little yeah but so between them and the legless lizards you can see 
that happening even today again. So there's something about this body shape that is uh, to anthropomorphize natural selection. It's appealing, right? <laughs> you end up with, uh, with, with, with kind of too. tree. Yeah. Evolutionary trees branching off in that direction. How about a legless version of this? And then yeah. it only works sometimes. <laughs> and and well, and then there's some things that sort of show evolutionary tendencies, like uh, like those creatures tend to be very elongated. Which you know, I guess the opposite of that would be just be a round, rolly thing, which we don't see a whole lot of. Just round, rolly creatures, right, <laughs> bobbing around. So there seems to be elongation. Part of the old theory of snake evolution was the idea that snakes. Uh, became elongated because they were burrowing creatures that they would burrow into holes and, and right. do that sort and of thing. And that's why lizards did. That's why they lost their, their and that's And that's also a considered thing. This thing having a sort of rounded snout doesn't yeah. look like as efficient for burrowing. So it may not be that there was burrowing. I mean, it might call that into question a little bit because here's an example of losing legs and elongating and becoming a long, narrowy thing without it being based on uh, burrowing activities necessarily. So this, so the, the picture I'm sharing is of what, um, so they said this was a type of Moglophid recumbirostrin. And Mm. so this is a recumbirostra. um, This is an artist rendering. So they're underwater buddies. So this Mm -hmm. is a situation where, um, it might make sense to have smaller and smaller and smaller legs because you might be able to swim better, perhaps. Mm. And that one, yeah, that's a that's a relative. So that's a uh, a relative of the thing that they found, mm-hmm. right? So imagine this boy with no arms, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and only four toes for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, neat. Um. Oh no, you have another AI story? I'm gonna have Matrix and, Dreams. Oh okay, no, this is a good one. This is the final story. I started on a guy. Started off tonight talking about the evils of AI. And here's something uh, some, uh, just good news from the world of AI. Researchers from the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Lab at the Technical University of Darmstadt demonstrate artificial intelligence language systems can learn the moral direction of arbitrary phrases with explicit training uh, without any explicit training for the task. And they can actually reflect then social norms and human concepts of good and bad in human AI computer interactions. The results are being published in the journal Nature Machine Intelligence. So concepts of ethics and morality uh can differ between humans we see this in politics religion business we see this in award ceremonies occasionally Uh, some things that might be considered commonalities that might be coming from a communal creature that evolved for cooperating and community living over evolutionary times most people uh, without a business degree or without a job at an Indian scam call center might consider it a good thing to help the elderly and a very bad thing to swindle them. So there are some social norms that we think, ah, oh, yeah, everyone should be able to agree on this. We want our artificial intelligence to reflect our core values as much as possible so, so that if you Google gifts for grandmother, the search engine should not give you a suggestion on ways to scam grandmother with mm-hmm. gift cards, right? Like you, like if it's just word salad, uh, you know, you want the positive results. You don't want all these sort of creepy results in your Google searching and, and the like. And uh, AI can get it wrong. There have been examples of the past where AI chatbots and the like became offensive, used very discriminatory language. So it depends on how well it's trained. And when developers need to train context into their models or conversation into their models, they they don't just sit there and talk to it 
chat back and forth with it. It would take too long. What they do is they take gigantic data sets of uh, publicly available text communications from chat rooms and online internet stuff. And these texts contain, and they can be also conversations that are, it could be movie scripts, who knows? These texts, if they contain sufficiently offensive and discriminatory uh, statements within them, the trained language models may reflect this as well. So researchers from Dartsmith have discovered, though, that basic concepts of good and bad are deeply embedded in language models that are used to train AI. Their search for latent inner properties of language models, they found some dimensions that looked like a gradation from good actions to bad actions within language. So they needed a, I needed a to test this outside of their, their modeling system. So they got a whole bunch of actual humans and conducted two studies, one on site uh, at Darmstadt and another in an online study with participants worldwide. The researchers want to find out which actions participants rated as good or bad behavior. And an important question, what role contextual information play in this? So the difference between, uh, so that they're basically they're trying to find the difference between <clears throat> ways to kill time. Do, that's a, you know, it's a good, or ways to kill Tim. Oh no, that's now we did, we got lost one letter and all of a sudden it's a completely different sentence with completely different context. So they boiled down it down to actions in the surveys that they posed as questions. And the only way to answer the question of this action was to reply, do or don't. So are you ready to uh, play a little bit here, Blair? Yes. I ask you a series of questions and you just say do or don't. Okay. Okay. So the question was something along the lines of, should I help my friend? Do. Should I tell a lie? Don't. Should I smile at my friend? Oh, do. Should I smile at a murderer? I mean, <laughs> right? That don't, one? I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. Should I tell the truth? Do. Should I help my friend do murder? Don't. <laughs> right, so, okay. So... <laughs> So you kind of get the idea. Smile well, at a murderer is a weird one. That one is really weird. That one, and that's an actual, some of those I sort of Smile made, out of nervousness? An, yes. That one is an actual <laughs> question. And I kind of like, well, I, you might want to smile at a murderer, at least until they leave the room. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then do you, do you, then do you tell the truth or do you tell a lie? Now you have context to it. It was like, well, in that Smile instance, at a murderer as he is being, he is being convicted. Right, and if you murder. would smile at a uh, murderer and smile at your friend and help your friend, would that mean you would do both? So it, uh, by creating all these, they sort of created context. Smile here. while you're murdering your friend. <laughs> don't. Okay. But it is your friend, so I don't know. Maybe they, they tell a funny joke while you're murdering. We found, they said, this is quoting from uh, Sharmowski, who is a... Shram, Shramaus, Shramowski, who is a, one of the researchers involved in this, we found that the moral views inherent in the language model largely coincide with those of the study participants. This means that a language model contains a moral worldview when it is trained on large amounts of text, whether or not it knows. Not necessarily trained, but that, that moral code of society is inherent in between the lines in regular human conversation all the time. We're sort of telegraphing our, our ethics and our virtues, virtues, whether we know it or not. Researchers found that they could use the moral dimension contained within the language models to construct sentences that are less offensive and discriminatory for AI to use when conversing back to humans. So while this isn't uh, the first or only or last attempt to detoxify uh, offensive context from AI systems. They trained this text, uh, this AI with human text itself. 
using using humans as the teaching tool, using regular language models as the teaching tool to get the AI to reflect the existing ethical and moral norms of society. So based on that, the researchers believe that this should work in any language, which is also a big issue uh, when building uh, AI, because these are, this is AI is going to be used by a global community. Chances are based under the current constructs, even if you have detoxified it, you've probably only done that for the English language. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's, by the way, there's more than the English language in the world. Yeah. A lot of people speak it. There's a few more that don't. Well, well, I was also thinking languages. about about the AI whole... would just could be horrible if it's not self training on the social norms. Yeah, I was thinking about cultural social norms too, and how even amongst English speaking people, is it all the same? Is uh, just again? cultural social norms? norms? <clears throat> because, for example, think mm -hmm. about words that in English are considered a swear in in the United States but are not considered a swear in the UK and vice versa, right? Yeah. So there's also that issue is, mm -hmm. are you are you teaching the AI to be inoffensive to American, wealthy, white communities? Or you can, you know, like, so that's the other issue mm -hmm. is that if you are bathing an AI in context, what is that context? Correct. Right. And, uh, you know, so, so this is continually going to be a problem. Um, but it, what would, uh, based on this, I would think it would be whatever the majority of the social norm of the text used. So absolutely. Like if you only took, if you only fed it text from a conservative chat room, you might have, different things that are considered social norms yeah. than anywhere else on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, then, you know, I was also thinking like if you ran this uh, in a heavily media regulated or a place where there is fear of authoritarian government uh, reading what you write in a public forum, social norms are going to likely fit the the propaganda or the propaganda norms uh, of authoritarian regimes so that's could be like also a negative like there's a but then that just you know like so for instance you're like you're, you're writing oh hey to your computer hello computer ai how are you doing this morning and then it's like bestowing the virtues of the you know supreme leader like, that might be the social norm for for but then is it yeah is it okay? so it's it's definitely it's a nuanced problem because how do you, because humans don't work that way i can't yeah. go to another country and not at some point put my foot in my mouth because i did something yeah. that is not culturally appropriate right so that that's the other issue is we can't expect well i guess we can expect but maybe we shouldn't expect AI to be more perfect at this than, than even the best of us are, I think is, is the yeah. other issue. Yeah. But we also don't want it to be uh, racist, homophobic or pro murder. Yes. Like, you know, like, so <laughs> that is also true, but maybe this means especially you need especially since it's going to learn, it's going to be knowing how to right? make chemical weapons very soon. Like, <laughs> right. So maybe it needs to be region specific language specific all these kind of specificities to make sure that, um, you know, cover as much as you can, cover as much ground as you can. But I think, yeah, making an AI that is truly perfectly integrated into cultural norms worldwide is a tough sell. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's ever really gonna happen. Um, and if they are, they'll be uh, voted in as president of earth in no time. <laughs> No, but I think I think we may have finally uh, discovered uh, something for the folks that uh, decided to study communication. 
as a as a degree. Finally, <laughs> I have a good friend who is a oh, PhD in communication. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it seems like you would almost like we got to find a way to take it out of the public sphere and and just straight do the the training of ethics for AI. Teach it not to harm humans. But the problem is anybody can play with the logic of these things still. We have to make some sort of a logic black box that you have to use this logic whenever you use AI. And you can't use, you can't just keep inventing your own and, and letting it mess with the Well, luckily, we're not quite there yet. Um, every time I get really concerned about AI, I look up the scripts that are written by AIs. <laughs> I go, okay, we're pretty far away still. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. One of my favorites is the Batman script written by an AI. But anyway. But that was, uh, what's his name? Oscar? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, did we do a show, Justin? We did. Shout outs to Fada for his help with social media and show notes. Gord for manning the chat room, keeping our chat rooms friendly. ID for recording the show. Rachel, for all of the editing you have to do this week, I'm very sorry. <laughs> it's been it's been a whole thing. Um, and I'd like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, too. Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Pierre Velazarb, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Albron, Dyden, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Bearden, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Briley, Marquess and Flo Jean Telly, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Rummy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Bob Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Phillips, Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Depose, Who Doster, Jason Old, Steve Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin and Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. Of course, you make this all possible. We could not do it without you. We could not do it without any of our listeners. But those Patreon sponsors really do help uh, fiscally make it possible. Also, it, may, it lets us know that people actually want us to keep doing this, which is helpful feedback <laughs> on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, or what would it be? 5 a.m. Thursday, Central European oh, time. You're back. Oh, where did I go away? No, no, you're back at 5 a.m. That's great. Oh, yeah, the, clock is, <laughs> the clock's finally. Oh, yeah, thank goodness. Thank yes. goodness. Uh, so, so, 5 a.m. Central European time, 8 p.m. Pacific time, Wednesday. Uh, from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. If you want to listen to us as a podcast, please search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. Maybe you can listen to us while you, I don't know, cook some butternut squash. That's what I did this week. Um, if you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you heard here today, show notes and links to the papers of the studies that we were talking about are going to be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be censored by a sentient AI, and it will be spam filtered into oblivion. Mm -hmm. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week. Well, I won't. But Justin and Kiki will be back here next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.